we'll get started then. Thanks, Nelly. Uh, my name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Today is September 21st, 2022. It's 1 p.m. and I call this meeting to order. A few brief remarks this morning or this afternoon, sorry. Um, <clears throat> first thing, um, we're going to need to do an executive session. Um, there is a prospective licensee that has a presumptively disqualifying conviction in their criminal history. But uh, based on the facts and circumstances surrounding the conviction, uh, the staff has recommended that they have overcome um, the presumptive disqualification and should be eligible to receive a license. So we'll talk about the staff recommendation in executive session, which I anticipate that we will hold after Bryn reviews all of the applications um, and social equity statuses and uh, before we take a vote on the recommendations. Um, no new retailers this week. I think you'll see in the register that there are six in resubmitted status. It is my understanding that these applications are either very near completion um, or need a final site visit before they are recommended for approval. Um, barring some issue in the site visit, I anticipate those applications should be um, ready for next week's meeting. Um, inventory tracking, we're going to do some additional trainings and walkthroughs of our inventory tracking system. Um, our plan is to do also kind of a Q&A at the end of those so that uh, licensees can just um, kind of interface with the board um, and Carrie Jaguer, our director of compliance, about how those um, tracking documents work and um, maybe some of the any questions that you have about definitions or, or what it is that we're actually asking for. Um, you know, in the meantime, just please continue to send your questions to the board. You know, they're very helpful in, um, you know, identifying areas of confusion and things that we might need to clarify. Packaging, um, we know that packaging is a complicated area of our rules. Um, we are the first and only state that has moved away from requiring child resistant packaging for cannabis flower. Um, of course, flour does not pose the same risk um, if it's accidentally ingested as, say, an edible. We asked the legislature to do this so that we don't have to rely on heavy-duty, non-recyclable, non-reusable, single-use plastic jars and lids for flour. Um, the legislature is willing to accommodate this request, but they didn't say that this could be a free-for-all. They required child deterrent packaging. This is a term of art. Um, that has a statutory definition, but there are no state or federal certifications or registries for child deterrence like there are for child resistance. Um, you can't, for instance, Google child deterrent packaging and find an index of products um, that have been approved by the Consumer Pro Product Safety Commission. We don't need to approve every child deterrent package um, we'd like people to use um, some common sense here. Is your packaging difficult for a child under five to open in a reasonable amount of time? Does it have characteristics like a, latch, a latching mechanism or tear resistance? Um, we did add a new tear resistant non-plastic mylar pouch with a zip lock um, for flour um, to our website under approved packaging. Um, so there is kind of an alternative to glass jars for people that are looking for that. Um, we also are going to have a supplemental one pager guidance document on packaging up on our website by the end of the week that will more clearly delineate what products need to be child resistant um, versus child deterrent and some basic tenants on how to achieve each. That's it for uh, my comments this week. Um, Julie, Kyle, you had a chance to review the minutes from last week? Yes. Yes. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Okay. Um, Bryn, I will uh, turn things over to you to review the staff recommendations for the week.
Okay. <clears throat> so um, here is your register for this week, um, starting with the uh, medical cannabis program here, as we always do, um, with the numbers of our new patient applications and renewal applications that we've received and patient cards issued um, and caregiver applications um, received and renewal applications received. So numbers are staying pretty consistent um, week to week. Medical staff are currently processing applications received on or after um, August 15th. So we remain five or six days behind, um, still working on uh, getting up to date with our backlog. Um, I'll move on to our adult use license application. Uh, these numbers are current as of yesterday. Um, and I highlighted a few, you know, I know this is really kind of a wall of numbers um, that I present to you each week. Um, staff is working on a number of reports, like fine tuning some reports that um, give a little bit more detailed information. Um, and I think that once we start to meet a little less frequently in the next several months, um, your uh, board meeting reports will look a little bit different. Um, but in the meantime, um, I tried to highlight a few areas of interest. Uh, you, the board has before it um, seven applications that staff is recommending for licensure, um, but there are a number of applicants in resubmitted status. As the chair mentioned at the outset, um, we've got several uh, manufacturers, tier one, two, and three in resubmitted status, um, six retailers and four wholesalers. And um, the folks that are in resubmitted status could either be waiting for um, a final review from our licensing team of the materials that they resubmitted, or they could be waiting for a site visit from our compliance team. Um, but my understanding is that uh, the majority of these applicants are very um, close to being ready for the board to approve for licensure. So you can see that we've got a number of um, those important parts of the supply chain, um, getting very close to being ready for licensure. And just highlighted the testing labs that we have licensed to, and we have two more in the queue. So I will move on to our list for this week. Um, as I mentioned, we've got seven uh, that are up for approval this week. Um, all of these applicants have demonstrated compliance with the requirements for their license that are contained in board rule and in statute. Um, we have Friendly Gardens applying for indoor tier one cultivation license. Can Able Farms um, indoor tier one cultivation license. Eddie Right On um, indoor tier one cultivation license. Tall Truck an indoor tier one cultivation license. Vermont Select a mixed tier two cultivation license, Green Valley Cannabis, a mixed tier one cultivation license, and um, lastly, Extract Vermont, um, seeing a manufacture, tier three manufacturing license. Um, so that is your list for this week. Um, uh -huh. Don't, just don't. <clears throat> um, we here are our numbers for license amendments. We've got um, five issued and six dismissed. Um, those are all part of the work that our licensing team is doing each week. Um, and then we've got our social equity information here. Um, this is a little bit of uh, new information for you in the social equity status determination pending table. Um, so staff is working on creating a report um, that gives some more information about um, our social equity applicants as they're moving through that early part of the process uh, before they come to the board for a status approval or denial. Um, so these are the numbers of those folks and where they are in the review process. And just to be clear, we, um, the staff recommend social equity status approval or denial to the board. Um, as soon as we have all the information we need to make that recommendation. So we don't wait until their license application is complete um, or until it meets a certain status. Um, as soon as their interview is done and we have all the information we need, we go ahead and make that recommendation to the board. But this does just provide a little bit of um, information about how many um, 
social equity applicants we have kind of in the queue waiting for their determination. <clears throat> and finally, we have um, two staff recommendations on social equity status this week. Both um, are recommendations for a denial. Um, so we have submission 1272 and submission 1165, and staff are recommending that um, the board deny social equity status for both of these applicants because they don't meet the criteria for a social equity individual applicant as defined by board rule. Um, and that's it for this week. Um, as the chair mentioned, we do have um, an application pending um, that is from an applicant who um, has some presumptively disqualifying offenses on their record. And um, we are, I, su I suggest we go into executive session to discuss uh, that application. All right, <clears throat> why don't we do that then? Is there a motion to enter into executive session? I move that the CCB go into executive session to consider confidential attorney-client communications made for the purposes of providing professional legal services to the body and that the executive session is required because premature general public knowledge regarding such communication would clearly place the board at substantial disadvantage. Are we having guests, I apologize, in our executive session today? Um, Susanna Davis uh, and Jay Green are both invited. So I further move that the board invite Susanna Davis and Jay Green from the Racial Equity Office uh, for the State of Vermont into executive session. I will second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, okay. Um, then I will resume. Um, again, James Pepper, this is the Vermont CCB meeting on September 21st, 2022. It's 1.26 in the afternoon and we just left executive session. Um, again, just for the record, we discussed a um, prospective applicant who had a presumptively disqualifying offense in their criminal history records, and there was a staff recommendation that the individual overcame their uh, presumptive disqualification and should be eligible to receive a license. And um, we discussed kind of the individual facts of the case and um, are ready, I think, to take a vote on that recommendation as well as all the others. I move that the board accept each of the recommendations for social equity status and licensing as presented to us by staff in this meeting. A second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, um, I believe all we have left uh, to do today is public comment. Um, we'll do this the same way we always do. If you join via video and would like to comment, um, please raise your virtual hands do our best to call on you in the order that your hand was raised. Um, and then we'll move to people that joined by the phone. Why don't we start with Marissa? Uh, hi there. Um, thank you. Uh, so my main uh, reason for um, wanting to comment there was um, uh, my company is All Education. We are responsible vendor trainers. And um, I have found that uh, Vermont is not following a lot of the same guidelines in terms of application and process uh, to become uh, what Vermont uh, calls an authorized vendor um, for uh, to serve the cannabis industry. Um, so. That's one concern. Um, we, we're coming from Massachusetts, and um, I noticed that there are other two other Massachusetts companies that have already been authorized. Um, I feel that the lack of transparency on this issue is a bit concerning. Um, we are, um, and we also um, here in Massachusetts, you know, a suggestion for the Vermont Cannabis Control Board is um, they produced a wonderful guideline document so that we really understand what's needed uh, to bring forth in order to um, get uh, credentialed and authorized. So um, yeah, these are just things that I wanted to speak on. Um, I think the process is, is abstract. And um, again, that lack of transparency is very concerning. Um, so uh, my company is gonna move forward. We will be um, submitting our uh, essentially what is an email um, with our uh, information shortly. Um, but uh, I think I think this process can be improved. Thanks, Marissa. Chris is next. 
Hi, this is Chris Vickers of Rootland Cannabis. I uh, chimed in a couple weeks ago and I uh, was talking about manufacturing and, and trying to roll that into tier one. And after giving it more thought, I, I realized that all cultivators are manufacturers. That's what we do. And it's, it's, it's kind of frustrating to have this all separated out and have another application fee and go through the whole processing again and more time, more energy. When I know your goal is to try and bring people into the fold, make them an easier process for them to be a part of this system. We as cultivators are manufacturers. Now I understand that if you want to bring it, if you want to be a manufacturer of other people's products, that that requires a different kind of license. I understand that. But if you want to process your own material and do things with it, that should be included in the application in the original cultivation license. And I believe that a lot of other cultivators feel the same way as me. And I would, I would kind of ask other cultivators to kind of chime in right now and raise their hand and say that they agree with that because having to jump through our hoops and having to pay another application fee is frustrating. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Marie. Hi, thank you. Um, again, I just want to make a comment about something. I don't know if it can be revisited. I, I don't know for a fact how this, I, I mean, I know that it is in, um, you know, part of compl compliance and getting your license, but um, it's something that I don't know if the regulation for it can be revisited because here's my situation as a manufacturer tier two, I am a sole owner. I'm only a tier two because I didn't want to be limited to what I could uh, receive as income, you know, for a year to 10 grand or under. So I opted for tier two based on that solely. But the thing is, I am a very, very small um, manufacturer. I'm a sole owner and sole employee. So with that, I will be responsible for every part of um, the process of manufacturing for my business until it, and uh, hopefully if I grow, um, which is my goal. But in the meantime, um, it's really a hardship for me to be basically scrounging from the dirt <laughs> to create something here, which I'm sure a lot of people are, but I am not blessed with, uh, I mean, I've cleared out my 401 and I've done everything I can to try and make this move forward. But the thing that I'm most concerned about is the fact that, um, I have to have $2,500 for a cessation of operations and for an escrow. And that money for a small, per, not I say small person, but a small operation is a money that could go toward my license or toward materials, packaging, um, advertisement, not advertisement, but like, um, you know, anything. And there's all kinds of things I could do with that. 2,500, especially starting out so small. Um, I'm hoping and wondering if there's any possibility that could be looked at again, just because if you look at the process uh, as a manufacturer, I won't be dealing with customers and I don't have, like they don't have a need for me, so to say, so to speak, to be in business. I don't have employees that are counting on me. So why the cessation of operations escrow for me? If anyone, if I stop, if I cease to exist, then it's my my it falls on me and nobody else is affected directly so i guess that's my comment i'm hoping that could be reconsidered thank you thanks marie alice okay unmute um hi i'm um alice peel i'm the chair of the waitsfield planning commission and I attend a number of these sessions um, and routinely update the Planning Commission on the activities and rules of the Cannabis Control Board. Um, one thing we kicked around last night relates to this rule. Um, it's in your um, violations document and um, um, it's under 4.5.3, 
category three violations and penalties. And we started looking at allowing consumption by any person of alcohol, cannabis, or other intoxic intoxicants on the premises of the cannabis establish or dispensary or in areas adjacent to the premises of the cannabis establishment or dispensary that are under the licensee's control except as authorized by the board. And the scenario we have, or we, we discussed, is that potentially we have a cannabis retailer uh, coming in to one of the um, vacant shops in our small, one of our small shopping areas. It would be located right in the middle of a row of stores. So the scenario we were looking at is someone comes out of this shop in a, in a rental, in, in a shopping area with other stores, um, a parking lot with a significant number of cars. They come out, persons that come out leave that front door and window, which would be the area right outside that shop. They could move down to in front of another shop or they could you know, wander off to their car in the parking lot or to one of the restaurants there and immediately light up and um, smoke yeah, some hopefully of Hopefully they do, you stuff. idiot. The question is, and they do, yeah. And the question is, who then is responsible? I mean, I don't envision a cannabis shop owner running across the parking lot to tell somebody not to light up. Um, my sense was more that the municipality or the town of Waitsfield would be more responsible in that scenario. But is this a violation, a reportable violation of the uh, retail shop owner? So that's kind of more of a question, but I'd point out that that's the scenario we're looking at. Like somebody smoking across the parking lot, does that person, does the retail shop warrant a violation and a notice? Thank, thank you for the question, Alice. And we, we don't generally do question and answer during the public comment period. <laughs> However, I think, um, you know, it's, it's a good point. Um, and I think that someone can probably be in touch with you. Um, just we did a municipal training last week and, um, you know, tried to take some questions in that venue, I believe. Uh, we have been working with the, the league to develop municipal guidance around some of these concerns. But um, it sounds to me, um, just based on your position, that we can find you relatively easily and, and we can just be in touch about that. Jeffrey. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Excellent. Um, thank you, board, uh, for all that you are doing. Uh, we understand you are spinning many nights still, so thank you uh, for all of the due diligence and work that you've been doing up to today. Uh, congratulations to the applicants that were approved today. Um, I have two quick uh, points uh, that I want to raise. Uh, by the way, uh, Jeffrey Pizzatello, um, executive director and co-founder of the Vermont Growers Association. Uh, we are the state's uh, trade association for our cannabis professionals. Um, two quick points, uh, but I wanted to actually, uh, if I can take a moment to address um, Chris Vickers, if, if you are listening, um, uh, heard about the manufacturing allowance for the tier one cultivator. It is something that we have been proposing uh, for nearly two years now. I urge you to reach out to us and others as well that are interested in this subject matter. Uh, we have developed extensive market structure that includes these sorts of allowances. Um, so I just want to take a moment to say that and thank you, uh, those cultivators for raising that important issue. Um, so uh, I want to uh, 
impart on the board that uh, as a trade association for the state, we are hearing more and more uh, from licensed cultivators and licensed manufacturers, albeit there are a few of them, um, concerns about uh, pricing, uh, concerns about price control, concerns about leverage. Uh, and we are talking about now uh, the formation of a market. So uh, as we're all aware, um, these conversations are beginning. Uh, and that is retailers are uh, approaching producers and wholesalers are approaching producers and they're negotiating and talking about price points. I mention this because, uh, and I am aware that the board is also aware of these issues. We've expressed this in the past. Um, this really is beginning to drive home uh, really intimately the importance of uh, some degree of direct to consumer allowances. Um, now we understand that uh, as an agency, you guys cannot uh, uh, develop licenses on your own, uh, but I want to take this moment uh, to urge you guys uh, in your capacity, either through legislative reports uh, or what have you, that come uh, 2023, that we make an effort, uh, that the board makes an effort um, to arrive at some form of direct to consumer. Uh, it is currently uh, our market structure, is, and you guys, you've heard us talk about this, it very much is a race to the bottom. Uh, when it comes to pricing. We would like to prevent some of the issues we see in other states. Uh, and we, we've all talked about this. We realize that some degree of direct-to-consumer is the solution here. Um, that being said, I just want to very briefly mention that uh, we are very proud to announce uh, that um, Vermont producers and small uh, cultivators now have a voice in Washington, D.C. Uh, the Vermont Growers Association is part of a national craft cannabis coalition. We've introduced a federal bill last week. It is called the SHIP Act. It introduces direct con to consumer allowances for small farmers and producers. And I just urge the public to check that out. Uh, and I thank you uh, board and attendees for your time. Have a good day, everybody. Thanks, Jeffrey. Tito. Hi, everybody. Um, I'd just like to quickly agree with Chris Vickers after growing flour, we have to do something with it, whether it's putting in a jar or rolling into a joint. It feels like pressing rosin should also be part of that. It doesn't feel like we should have a, a separate license for that. Maybe the bar moves a little bit so that you need a manufacturing license if you're using solvents, for example, down the road. But it would be nice to see that line move and see basic manufacturing simply included with everyone's grow licenses. Thank you. Thanks, Tito. Keith. Hello, CCB. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you, Mr. Pepper. My question is, my, my comment this week is in regards to, you guys have been working at this for 18 months? We were seated in April. And yeah. burn hair that there is no executive director report on the progress that you guys have done in the last 18 months. In other jurisdictions and other states, most executive directors put out a once a month report on what the what the Cannabis Control Board is doing. I have yet to seen that. I watched one the other day down in Massachusetts where their regular directive board gave a six hour executive director um, YouTube channel presentation on what they're, what they're doing down there. They also, down in other jurisdictions. I'm wondering, my other comment is, I know this is a board meeting, but is this board meeting meant for you guys or is this more be board meeting meant for the stakeholders? Because some of the things you do in this board meeting, like your executive decisions of um, licensing and stuff, can that be done on your own on a different time and that this platform could be utilized for us to have a question and answer session? And can you space time for a question and answer? Because there's a lot of people out there that are asking questions and answers and they're not getting them. And they're, I feel that they're, they're not being heard in that way. And I'm sure a lot of people could agree with me that there's a lot of questions that still need to be answered that are not on the website. I viewed the website recently and last week you said there would be safety vendor training information on the website. I didn't find it. I didn't find anything on the website about the track and trace that Carrie posted last week. Um, so that's like running a week behind that people have questions about and supposedly we'll be able to open in 11 days, 10 days or whatever on the first, but I guarantee none of going to be open that day because there's not enough product out there right now anyways. It's still going to dry cure and everything else. Um, and I'm just curious why the 
there's no executive director report and why there's that can be done on this platform or a question and answer session weekly because and give at least two or three hours for everybody to come on here like we are now now to be able to get our questions answered that we're not and my other question is who is running the medical my other comment is who's running the medical section right now out of the three board chair chairpersons right there between you mr pepper and julie and and kyle because i assume looking on the website recently that Lindsay Wells is only an administrator now, and she's not the director. And I still believe there should be a director, and I want to know where you guys are going to go, my comment is, with the medical process. I know you held two roundtables. I know you're probably speaking to legislatures and the upcoming session, and the fact that Sears Med now has a adult use license, are they going to do away with their medical program? That's my other comment. Is that just going to go by the wayside? Are you guys trying to do away with the medical program? Because in the 18 months, I've only seen two roundtables and very little discussion on the medical program. And there's a lot of questions that the medical program needs work. And, and I feel without a medical director, my comment is that <coughs> you guys are focusing on the adult use and your hands are tied, overseeing your staff members, overseeing other people. Brenda's overseeing hiring people, overseeing other legal administrative duties that she has to deal with, along with your co-counsel there from, this, from the attorney general's office. Um, and I don't want to know who's going to focus on that because there's only three of you. And that's also a quorum in the state of Vermont under Vermont meetings laws. There should be five of you because the quorum is only voted on two of you and only two of you vote on any of this stuff. Not three of you, not five of you. So there's Julie and Kevin and Kyle normally voting on most everything that you agree upon. And that's a quorum under Vermont state meeting laws. And I'm just commenting on that because those are things I noticed. And I'm sure a lot of other people can agree. And where's your media relations person is my other comment and the other comment who's the chief financial officer for the ccb because i know you're running you're basically running a business and i'd like to have that comment put in there too and i do like the comment from marissa from massachusetts some things on the cc board here is a little difficult to read and massachusetts is much more active. and they've had five years to, to update their stuff too but thank you for your time today and appreciate your work yeah, thanks you. richard well, hi, folks. First off, thanks to the board for all the work that you've done, and congratulations to uh, to everybody that's been approved. Um, my comment is probably pretty low on your list of priorities. I know you got bigger fish to fry, but as a Vermonter looking at this opportunity and wanting to get involved uh, in in legal cannabis in Vermont, uh, I looked at the at the licensing and the Tier One manufacturing license. Looks like it was designed for. Uh, somebody like me who who wants to get involved, but after putting a pencil to it, it just doesn't make sense with the ten thousand dollar revenue cap when it looks like to a layperson anyway that all the other requirements are the same as a a tier two, tier three, the license application, the license fee, uh, the product fees, the banking requirements, the insurance requirements, and by the time you put in the cost of the of the raw materials. Um, it just doesn't make sense. So I would encourage the board to take a look at at modifying the tier one manufacturing license uh, requirements or the or the limitations that you put on it, so that um, it would make a financial sense for a Vermonter who wants to participate in this industry. Uh, thank you much. Yeah. Thanks, Richard. Dave. Hey guys. Um, Thank you for the work today, and uh, especially for uh, approving a uh, an at scale uh, manufacturer. That's very important from our launch. Uh, appreciate it. I want to uh, just ring the alarm bell on testing. Um, the I found out yesterday from Bia, uh, which I understand is the only testing lab that is able to do um, pesticides and pathogens testing, that their machine is down and they're not able to do them right now. Uh, and they hope that they'll be able to start doing them next week. Um, I don't need to show you the calendar. Uh, I think we're all well aware that that is really cutting things extremely close. Uh, and I'm not aware of much, if any product that has already passed all of that required training. So a couple of thoughts there. Uh, one is your rules uh, have a waiver for pesticides testing. 
uh, for folks who are approved pesticide free, pesticide free by independent third parties, but you've yet to um, designate any third parties as approved to uh, provide that certification. Um, I think that uh, at this point in the calendar might be a rather urgent priority. Um, and, uh, you know, if there's anything else that we can do to uh, speed up uh, that testing, uh, it would be greatly appreciated. Um, we are uh, taking inventory at Flora. Uh, we have a nice variety of inventory in and coming in. Uh, do a quick plug. If anyone has packaged uh, eighths and quarters, we'll uh, love to talk with you. Um, but, um, you know, it's really difficult um, without all that testing done and with everything uh, on hold over there at BIA. So uh, would appreciate anything that you guys can do on that front. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. LB Farm. Maybe go to the next person. We'll get back to the LB farm if they uh, unmute. Uh, oh, they, it looks like they just lowered their hands. Uh, there is not currently anybody else with their hand raised. All right. Well, if um, if you would like to make a public comment, you join via the video, raise your um, virtual hands, and we'll also open it up to people that join via the phone. Um, you can hit star six to unmute yourself if you join via the phone. Matt just raised his hand. Matt L. Oh, hey, hello. Hey, hello. Um, I wanted to chime in on the pesticide testing that David Silberman had brought up. As a third party certifier through Clean Green, your rules explicitly state that a third party that tests for pesticides, and if someone follows and fulfills those obligations under that certification, they are not required to test for pesticides. I personally don't believe any third parties need to be approved by you folks, because I believe it's not written in, in the rules as such. But I'm worried about the testing component as brought up that BIA is having issues. And so how can a market open in less than 10 days when product hasn't passed testing? Is that not a liability for the consumer? So I, I think this market is extremely inequitable. I think it's been extremely unfair on how the licenses have rolled out for a few while so many are sitting in the queue. And I'm not really happy with, well, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Yep, thanks, Matt. Uh, the phone number ending in 5230 has unmuted. Yeah, hello. My name is uh, Zeb Overton, licensed grower, hopefully licensed retailer. Just wondering, uh, what what is the? I know I understand it's not a Q and A. I just wanted to make a couple comments. Just wondering if it's realistic that we're opening on time, and uh, just wondering on my application, wondering where it's at. I've submitted it a week and a half ago to get being communicated with somebody a week and a half ago. Still waiting. I mean. I'm a, I'm a Vermonter. I got everything in this. I'm ready to open. Uh, just, you know, I'm just wondering uh, if we could move on the retails getting approved. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. Louis or Lewis. I'm not sure if your name is pronounced Louis or Lewis, but uh, either way, you have your hand raised. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. 
Oh, okay, sorry, I wasn't. All right, so yeah, it's Lewis from Good Harbor Cannabis Insurance. So this was in regards to the comment that the woman made earlier about the funds that need to be set aside for cessation. Um, this was just more of sort of a statement that anybody out there, if they don't have the funds to set aside, uh, a bond can be purchased. And so if folks you know, don't have that 2,500, the 5,000, whatever it is, the bonds are fairly inexpensive. And I don't know if the board was going to do anything about what she had said, but that is an alternative that we've helped a lot of clients with. So people are welcome to contact us or anybody who, you know, helps them that, where they can get a bond to uh, to cover that cessation. That's just what I wanted to mention. Thanks, Lewis. Okay. Anyone else for a public comment? All right, I will close the public comment window then. Um, thank you all for your comments. Uh, we do listen, uh, we try and um, address these issues and when we see common issues, we try and write guidance around them. We do talk about them in between meetings. Um, so thank you for raising all of those excellent points. Um, and uh, if there's nothing else from Julie or Kyle, then I will um, adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Thank you.